Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, this is Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, and it is brought to you by the AC Airport. Plan your summer vacation now. Spirit Airlines is offering nonstop flights from Atlantic City International Airport to Boston, Atlanta, San Juan, Miami, and other exciting destinations. Visit Spirit. Com. Jeff Mosher is one of the co-hosts of the Inside the Birds podcast, and he joins us now here on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN. This is Football at Four. Jeff Mosher, what is happening, friend? How you doing, Mike? All right, so I'm doing good. All right, uh, here we go. We got a lot to dive into here. I guess yesterday on the show, Adam uh, kind of insinuated that there's a good possibility that Andy Wydell would not be here When you and I spoke today, well, he seems to be right. This is now the fourth member of the Eagles front office who has left this offseason. But this might be the biggest one. Andy Wydell goes to Pittsburgh. He's not the GM. He's the assistant GM. So tell us about the loss and him moving from Philly to Pittsburgh. So, yeah, um, so this goes back to sort of it, it links the Steelers and the Eagles. Um, the Steelers were doing a GM search, as I've told you many times on, on this show, that they, there are two things that the Steelers really value. One is grooming and promoting and continuity. And Omar Khan has been there for a long time, I think since 2001, uh, working his way up mostly the, the kind of the cat management sector, but he's done a little bit of everything and he, he's sort of, I, I kind of call him kind of like the Howie Roseman of that franchise, except not as much power, but in what he's able to do. Um, and then they also value people with Pittsburgh ties. There are a ton of Steelers from Kevin Colbert, who's retiring. He's from Pittsburgh. Doug Whaley came through that front office from Pittsburgh. Brandon Hunt, who's, who was with them and interviewed for the, the Eagles uh, recently, we talked about from Pittsburgh. So they, they have an identity about them. They know what they want in players, and they know that the city's – uh, dynamic is a big part of that, and so when Kevin Colbert moving on, what they wanted, to, what they wound up doing was valuing what they had in house with Omar Khan. And I was told a couple of weeks ago, about a week and a half ago, maybe longer than that, that if Omar were to get the job, he was going to because he's not a true scout, scout the way you know coming up through the football way, um, that he would probably he would need that the team would want a personnel type person to go. Uh, along with him to lead the scouting staff. And, of course, that's what Andy Weidel has done here in Philadelphia. And, again, Andy Weidel has the Pittsburgh ties, and his first job in scouting was there in Pittsburgh for, uh, I think, a year or two um, before he went on to New Orleans, which is where he met Omar Khan, by the way. Um, So he already knew Omar, and then he went out and interviewed for the GM job, uh, did not get the GM job, but he was. I was told he really impressed Mike Tomlin, who has a very big presence in this decision. It's ultimately – Art Rooney the second's decision, uh, the Rooney family, but Mike Tomlin has an increasing presence there and power, as you would expect with his record. So it worked out for the Steelers to be able to pair the in-house guy that they've been grooming, Omar Khan, with a guy like Andy Weidel to take the place of what they had with Kevin Colbert and and so forth going going forward. And so, so yeah, so they get Andy Weidel. I'm sorry, they get Andy Weidel and. Andy has a chance now to go back home and, and lead one of the greatest front offices in all of sports. <laughs> yeah, so he leaves uh, Philadelphia this the fourth. Now, are they replacing? Does this restructure? How is it all set up in Philadelphia? You know, they're kind of left with an empty hand here all of a sudden. Uh, and yeah. Cunningham, Brandon Brown, Kathleen Rach, and now – Andy Wydell, plus they got rid of other people. So, right. I mean, right. do they have anybody filling the chairs at the Novacare complex? Yeah, and don't forget Tom Donahoe left as well. And he was a, he was a, had a huge influence not only on Andy Weidel, um, because Tom started off in Pittsburgh, you know, to Pittsburgh and Buffalo, but um, also on Andy Weidel's staff. So Tom was a valuable asset for a lot of the younger scouts and Andy. So that was a big loss as well. Um, so... Here's the thing, like, yeah, it, 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 I, I think we talked about this um, when, when the first set of moves came. The Eagles are, are making some changes. Why? I couldn't tell you. you know, is the timing curious? Sure. Like, they were going to lose some of these people, no doubt about it. They would have had to replace them anyway. But in the case of some, and we'll talk about Andy Weidel here, 
I mean, as far it's it's not to my knowledge, they did not offer him to be the assistant GM of the Eagles or offer him to try to stay with a better promotion or a better title. They're letting him go to the Steelers. So what does that tell you? <laughs> they are they're changing their dynamic. Uh, they want to get younger. I believe we talked about that. More diverse. We talked about that. And then, as as people who I've known, who I've spoken to, who know or are familiar with what the Eagles are thinking and doing, uh, more forward thinking. They, they want their philosophy on on scouting and personnel to change a little bit. Um, we'll see what that means. You know, I, I don't know forward thinking. I need a little bit more context to that. But, you know, the Eagles are always priding themselves on being on the cutting edge and newer, newer things and, you know, analytics and stuff like that. So we'll see what it, we'll, we'll have to see when they announce the full list. We've already reported on some of the guys they've brought in, uh, people they brought in and, and promoted. But there's going to be more, as you just said, because there's a lot of seats to fill. But they're clearly changing w- their operations, some of it for some of it wa- intentionally. And I think the big question is why and what kind of impact will that have on the team? Not this year, but I would say two or three years down the road when the results of this new front office will be judged. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, Wydell got here in 2016. So he was a part of the front office that put, you know, some of that Super Bowl team together and then everything afterwards. So, you know, losing four guys, he is the most impactful guy. Or, and obviously, Catherine's a female, but. The most mm-hmm. impactful of the group, correct? Well, I mean, he was he was in yeah. Once Joe Douglas left and he stepped into Joe Douglas's role, he was the person who presided over the entire scouting staff. Right. But but many of the moves that we've seen made over the last month in the front office, as far as guys not brought back or fired or whatever, you know, we've been told that that that's Howie Roseman's decision. So somewhere along the line. What Andy used to do and what he what was going on over the last month, month and a half seemingly changed there. If you, you see it, like how he was starting to have exert who's going to get hired, who's going to do what, who's going to be here and there. Mm-hmm. So I, I just find that interesting. So uh, we'll are, see, you, you, su- are you suggesting that Roseman has inherited more power? Well, I mean, he's always had absolute power, right? I mean, nothing could happen without him signing on. Yes, I agree. But. These moves that have been made, as far as some of the guys that they're bringing in, even before Andy left, um, you know, it's my understanding those are Howie Roseman's decisions. They're not being brought to him by somebody, and he's saying, "Yeah, that's a good idea. I sign off on mm-hmm. it." Um, John Gannon spoke yesterday. Oh, by the way, before we move on from that, is there anything you would like to add regarding this front office, this Andy Wydell stuff, before we we kind of check in? on some of the stuff that Gannon, I thought, was interesting yesterday. Yeah, no, I, I guess what I would just – I've always kind of talked about the Eagles' identity and continuity and their lack of continuity, and it's sort of a – in my in my estimation, it's when you look at some of the most stable franchises, the Ravens, the Steelers, the Packers, um, franchises that tend to – they don't win the Super Bowl every year, obviously, but they're not as up and down, right? You know, the Eagles – tend to be up and then down, then back up as they are right now. They're, they're tr- trending back up and then down and they'll have these bottom out seasons. And, you know, I've always said continuity with them, especially in the front office and the forging of an identity has always been something that, in my opinion, has eluded them. You know, they do do certain things well as far as investing in the trenches, you know, strong offensive line, strong defensive line. That's their identity. But as far as like what it is to be an eagle and what they want from a, a talent addition standpoint, and who they are as a team, I feel like that identity seems to waver pretty frequently. You know, every three to five years, it feels like you're on to something new. And I think that that's, that would be why I would say, like, yes, when you, when you see them play a primetime game and they always say, oh, Eagles are, you know, like fifth in the NFL and win since 1990. You know, like one of the models of, of consistency. And I say, well, yes, that is true. A lot of that is weighted by Andy Reid. But if you go back to 2011 till this past season, that's 10 years you know, there's the Super Bowl year, 2017, and 2018, they won a playoff game. But I don't think they've won a playoff game in any of those other eight years of that 10-year span. They've made the playoffs in some of them, but they've also had a couple of four-win seasons as well. That, that's my point about the peaks and valleys that I think what separates them from joining the Ravens or the Steelers or the Packers or some, the, what the Chiefs have become since Andy got there. It's just always so consistent. 
So again, a lot of these names that we talk about, nobody knows. So it's it's like ah, I don't care. This person left. That person left. But it's it's it it has an impact on a team. Uh, before we get to Gannon, um, we mm-hmm. spoke in the last hour and was brought up that the Eagles have a do they have a Super Bowl roster and not a Super Bowl quarterback. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know if they have a Super Bowl. Are they like roster. the I mean, are they the twenty twenty two NFC version of last year's Denver Broncos, where everyone's like, they have a really good roster. It's just the quarterback's the problem there. Well, by the way, that is a kind of a big if. I mean, if you put like um, you know Aaron Rodgers on like seven or eight teams that are just okay, I bet you that they're, they're going to be pretty darn good, right? <laughs> so it, it's you can make that argument, but I also think that you know they're devoid of some superstars in other areas too. You know, I mean, they have good pass rushers, but if Hassan Reddick is now their best pass rusher, he's not Aaron Donald. He's, he's about 11 or 12 sacks. I mean, not J.J. Watt. You know, Darius Slay is a good corner. I wouldn't call him the top three or four corner. Um, overall, I mean, their linebackers are better, but they're not great linebackers. Well, we have yet to see what N'Kobe Dean's going to be. Uh, clearly struggling at safety. Strong offensive line, really strong defensive line, good wide receivers with A.J. Brown. So, they're good. They're a good team, and sure, if you put Tom Brady on them, maybe they're a Super Bowl contender. But that's sort of an unfair. Like, uh, I mean, every every good ten to eleven win team would love to have the best or second best or third best quarterback, and then be considered a Super Bowl contender. Yeah. Um, all right. So yesterday, John Gannon had some interesting things to say. I thought one of the questions you asked him was uh, about going seven or eight deep with the pass rush. A lot of guys. Uh, how do you you know plan on you know navigating those guys? And he said, you know, the more rushers, the better. But I guess the question is, and I talked about this with Adam. I want to see what you think is like how. Uh, you know, they're talking about multiple fronts and thirties and fifties and changing it around, and you're going to get all these different looks. Are you going to see Hargrave and Fletcher Cox together, and they'll be a pair, and then those two come off, and Davis is by himself, and we go with three. You know. Is there a rotation here? How do you envision getting all these guys the prerequisite of snaps that's going to make them, um, you know what I mean? Yeah, you're asking me the question I was asking John, and John didn't give me the answer, so I can't give it to you. Um, I, you know who had the best answer for that? Well, not to, to pat the back of the company, but Quentin, Michael, and Jason Vaughn talked about it on Q&A on our platform. It was out yesterday. And Quentin made a really good awesome kind of envision of what he saw that I think probably might be consistent with what Gannon might see. Um, and it all is depending on is Jordan Davis ready to be a starter as a, a, I'm sorry, a first and second down player immediately from day one. Is he healthy? Is his weight down? Is he productive? Because what Quinton was saying is you could theoretically have a five, two front, which is what Jonathan Gannon played a lot last year on first and second down with, Jordan Davis as your middle guy, your, what they call the nose. He lines up right over the center. And then he's flanked by Fletcher Cox and Javon Hargrave, okay, as your kind of interior rushers. But they, they might be defensive ends in the 3-4, but for this 5-2, you've got Jordan Davis flanked by Cox on one side and, and Hargrave on the other. And kind of like a – Har, Hargrave's in like a five technique. He might be head up on the guard, whereas Fletcher's playing more in the, in the gap on the shoulder three technique, which is what he's used to playing. And then you have Hassan Reddick as your strong side linebacker on the line of scrimmage. And then Josh Sweat playing kind of a wide nine format, which gives him the space to get off the ball quickly. So that's, that's your five man defensive front. And when you say it that way, it sounds pretty impressive. I mean, to be able to go, you know, from left to right or right to left, you know, Reddick, Hargrave, Davis, Cox, Sweat is pretty good, I would think, and that helps you get your best talent on the field. I just don't know what that would mean for Brandon Graham, Milton Williams, and Derek Barnett. Right. That that was almost exactly what I was asking Adam yesterday. Is like, there's different configurations, but how long can you play that configuration? Like, how often are you going to change those configurations? Right, because some of those guys I mentioned. Or every down players can play in other spots. Yeah, you don't want them coming off the field. It's one thing if you're just taking that five-man front against the run and then taking off the field. And then you're jogging on Graham and Barnett and um, Bill Williams, but you, you still want Hassan Reddick. The only guy who you really want coming off is Jordan Davis. So that still leaves you with Reddick, Hargrave, Cox, and sweat. So 
obviously you need some depth and you need some backups, but Graham and Barnett are not the kind of guys who are used to playing backup roles. You know, like Chris Long was have accepted that role by the time he came to the Eagles. Bo Allen was very happy being a number three or a number four defensive tackle. So was Malik Jackson or Haloti Nada. They were at the twilight of their career. So maybe Brandon Graham will be accepting of it. Um, but Derek Barnett, I mean, I guess he has no choice. He signed back on a one-year deal. Um, but you want to get the best out of everybody. So you just hope everyone kind of buys in and, and um, listen, the injuries always happen, and that will probably wind up you know, forcing some guys into action too. The other question that I thought was maybe the most intriguing answer was, um, you know, I guess he was asked, he was kind of been given an out to say, like, hey, you know, is it fair to say that fans will see more of what you want to do defensively rather than what you did, you know, last year? And he was like, no, I wouldn't say that. So, in other words, like, he's basically <laughs> saying, yeah, I did what I wanted to do last year. It just didn't work. I mean, like, where everyone's trying to give him the benefit of the doubt to say, well, he didn't really have the personnel, so was he just covering for the guys he had last year? I think a little bit of both. I mean, you know, I, I was a little curious about some of the, the way the ways he chose his wording yesterday. You know, I mean, I, I, I think he does try to cover for his team, but I also think if I'm reading tea leaves and just getting to know this guy, I think he really is more upset that things didn't go well in the first eight games, especially last year, because concepts he felt that they should have been able to execute, they did not execute. Whereas I looked at it, and a lot of people looked at it, as you're trying to execute concepts that this team has not executed in the past. So you're asking them, I always say, the job of a coach is to put a player in position to succeed. And I believe that he did not have the personnel he wanted, and yet he still tried to put players in a position that he thought was going to be successful, but clearly was not. And he went eight weeks of doing it before he made some major changes. And looking back on it, I wish he would have just said, you know, now we can do what we want to do more. I tried, but uh, he, he sort of, I think if you gave him the chance to do it all over again last year, he would have d- done the same thing. And that's a little concerning to me. Right. So he, he's kind of been saying, hey, you got all this different personnel. Is that going to change the way you call defense? <laughs> Nah, yeah. not really, um, you know, and uh, I, I thought that was one. And then, you know, he, he was kind of asked about Jordan Davis, and he kind of insinuated that they think that he can, you know, cut his ears back and just go after the passer. That's not something that a lot of people have seen from him so far. Well, I did hear him say he's more than a zero, even though in that scenario we just talked about, he's head up over the center and he's playing that zero technique and he's occupying two gaps. They do believe, and they drafted him, on the promise of in, in a, you know, at some point in his career, he's going to be a upfield guy. It may not be 10 to 12 sacks, but most interior tackles get you anywhere from five to seven and a half. like a hello. Dinata will get you six or seven Vita Vey will get you five to seven. You know, they, they don't think he's Aaron Donald. Okay. Mm-hmm. They didn't say that, but so, but they do say he has some traits and movement abilities that are probably more like, a Fletcher Cox, like a three technique who gets up the field, than just a, a pure, like, uh, old Tony Siragusa type player who's just basically out there to be a big wall, okay? So that they do think he's got more movement traits, and you've seen it on tape. I mean, he's just an athletic, um, you know, freak of nature. So they got to get that out of him, but I'd be very surprised if they used him in, any of, in that kind of capacity early in the year. I, he's not a pass rusher. He's got a lot of work to do, um, and they just got to get him on the field healthy, you know, um, at the right weight and being able to stop the run. That was their number one problem for the first eight games last year with the style of defense that Gannon wants to play was getting gashed. And so his job is to stop, make sure they don't get gashed. All right, uh, Jeff Mosher and, of course, uh, Football at Four. You can check out the Inside the Birds podcast as uh, we've got uh, plenty going on right now with the uh, OTA set to begin. The the, uh, Eagles obviously reshaping their room on the defensive side of the ball. John Gannon yesterday, they lose Andy Wydell. We'll have plenty more during football at four this week right here on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN. And check out InsideTheBirds.com and the latest Inside the Birds podcast drops uh, Monday when uh, Thursday morning, 6 a.m. And Q&A, the new edition uh, is out right now on the YouTube platform with Quentin Michael and Jason Avant. Go check out those guys over at the Inside the Birds YouTube channel. All right, Mosh, we'll catch you, bud. Have a good weekend. Memorial Day. 
We're you too, man. Monday. I'll catch I up with you. you am, I not, am I not here on Monday then? Or no Monday. Wednesday? We are okay. off Monday. All right. Well, have a great weekend. I'll see you Wednesday. All right, brother. Take care. There's Jeff Mosher here from uh, InsideTheBirds.com.